it's Dr. Tofai. Welcome to Hernie Talk Live, our weekly session here with me, Dr. Sharin Tofai, your hernia and laparoscopic surgery specialist. Many of you are joining me on Facebook Live at Dr. Tofai and Zoom. And thanks to everyone for following me on Twitter and Instagram at Hernia Doc. Like always, this and all previous Hernia Talk Live sessions will be available for you to watch on my YouTube channel, which if any of you follow me on YouTube, which I hope you do, I actually spent a lot of time revamping it. So I hope you all like it. So our guest today is Dr. Dina Podolsky. I'm really excited to have her because she is uh, like me, a hernia surgery specialist. She loves hernias. It's, I believe everything she does, we'll get to ask her. She is currently in New York out of Columbia University where she has a very busy practice. And I'm super excited that she took some time off to devote to us an, uh, an hour <laughs> today after work. So I really, really appreciate it, Dina. Thank you so much. Yeah, of course. Thank you for inviting me. So um, I guess that's one of my questions is, is that all you do or do you do other, you take call and do other operations besides hernias? Yeah. Uh, elective hernia surgery is about 95% of my practice. And wow. then the rest is ACS call. I think that's so wonderful. When I was a resident, definitely hernias was not something people aim to, to specialize in or operate on, but um, is that something you were interested in going into residency? Yeah. I mean, even when I was a resident, which was less than five years ago, I graduated residency in 2018. I mean, the only hernia operation I ever did was a lap eye pump, you know, at, and also, you know, an open and laparoscopic and little hernia repair, but we weren't doing complex abdominal wall reconstruction at all. That was just a couple yeah. of years ago. I think the field is, we are living through the transformation of the field. I mean, it really started, you know, with the Henneford and that whole crew yep. legitimized the yeah, hernia Dr. world. Dr. Todd Henneford, he was a guest on our hernia talk. You guys can watch it. Absolutely. Uh, and year, it's like a year and a half ago. Yeah, they, you know, they started legitimizing the field with good research, pushing yep. lap by bombs, then the whole Henneford family tree, my partner, Dr. Nowitzki, I mean, yep. all those folks, they've, um, they've grown the field before our very eyes. And I'm not sure that uh, having a hernia center is something that most academic medical institutions have right now, but I think we are in the process of most academic medical institutions getting something like this. Right. So, you know, what's interesting is the operations, uh, some of the operations have changed, but like an open angle hernia repair really hasn't changed that much. But I feel like the residents nowadays are much more excited to do it. Whereas when I was a resident, we weren't that excited to do the same exact operation. And maybe it's because we as surgeons that are teaching them are excited about it and kind of approach it much more academically than uh, before where it was just a hernia and you just kind of sent the most junior person to cover the operation and senior people want to do like the liver case and the pancreas operation, these big operations. And not just absolutely hernia, right? there's um there's an excitement around the field yeah. even in the time that i've been at columbia for the last four years the residents this year i mean so many of them have said they want to go into ab wall you never heard that a couple of years ago yeah but you if you're a resident and you have attendings who are excited about stuff and are teaching you new stuff and you have good results and you feel like you're actually helping patients i mean that that gets people excited that's true. We have uh, at Cedar Sinai, we have a residency program and an MIS bariatric fellowship. And it, both interviewing for the residency and interviewing um, candidates for the fellowship, literally people come in and say, We want to come because you offer abdominal wall, you know, like excellence in abdominal wall. We want to have that experience. And it's it's fascinating. I mean, I love it. I'm I'm glad that I I'm in this field because I think it's fun, but um, it wasn't like that as, you know, even five years ago, almost. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. But if you think about it, the amount of folks with hernias out there compared to the amount of folks with liver disease, pancreas disease, et cetera, yeah. you're going to be able to treat a lot more hernias during your career than you are probably most other pathology. So if yeah. you go into this field and you do it well, you have the potential to help a lot of people. That's very true. And I would say also that the um, it's not 
the residents that graduate too, they learn very quickly. You can do all the fun kind of big Oregon operations, but once you graduate, the number one operation you're going to be doing over and over again, is going to be hernia surgery. So uh, Absolutely. pay attention and learn how to do it correctly. Yeah, because, you know, I think we have a little bit of a myopic view because we're at big academic medical centers, but yeah. the majority of surgeons in this country are not in giant urban centers, yeah. <laughs> giant medical centers, you know, and there's a huge need for general surgeons outside of urban centers. Yeah. And the two things you're going to be doing as that type of doctor out there is hernia and endoscopy. Well, endoscopy, colonoscopy. Uh, endoscopy, sure. Yeah. So, yeah, it's a great it's a great thing to learn. I'm happy there's finally getting some respect put on the hernia name. Uh, agreed. So on that note, you belong to the Columbia Hernia Center, Columbia Surgery Hernia Center, which I believe may be the only department, freestanding department that is completely doc, like devoted to hernia surgery. Is that right? The only division. We are the first the division, division of a yeah, we're the first division of abdominal wall surgery in the country. Yeah, fascinating. I'm so fascinated by it. I, I saw Dr. Visky, uh in Manchester uh, a couple months ago. And yeah, I just want to learn more. Like, how did you make it happen? How'd you do it? Because from a business standpoint, right? Um, uh, just so people understand, like hospitals have departments, department of medicine, department of surgery, department of gynecology. And then within that department, there are divisions and each division is kind of a financial, it's like a little house, right? Within a community. Yes. And you have to be able to um, pay for that house. <laughs> uh, <to laughs> your surgeons, your nurses, your uh, office space, whatever. And usually hernia surgery gets bulked into general surgery. So they do everything, gallbladders, et cetera. Or if you're kind of in an advanced situation, you may have hernia surgery bulked into the minimally invasive groups. So they do gastrectomies, cholecystectomies, colectomies, and they do hernias. But to have a freestanding division for hernia abdominal wall is like amazing. I'm just going to be watching you guys and learning. It's Have you noticed a difference in and how it affects your practice? Um, I don't know about my practice because I don't know if folks know what a division mm. versus a department is. You know, like sure. I think patients are coming to us because of me, Phil and Yuri, because of advertising, because of Columbia, you know, because of the center. Yes. But um, I mean, first of all, Dr. Novitsky is leading the charge here right he's an internationally sure. acclaimed hernia surgeon he had the he's a professor of surgery at columbia he has the reputation the experience and the results to get it done right. but to tell you the truth there was a lot of excitement at columbia the minute we got there the other departments and the other surgeons were happy to send us their stuff because um the reality is that hernias have just gotten really complex and if you do one bad hernia operation, it's going to come back to bite you. Oh, yes. So if you're a liver surgeon and you just spend all this time doing a liver transplant and then you have an incisional hernia and then you do the only hernia operation you know how to do and the patient recurs and recurs, who wants to deal with that? You know, folks yeah. are happy to have us come and like, you know, fix the problem. So the department was ready and open. There was a lot of excitement behind it. We had a great leader. We have a great team. It seems very seamless right now at Columbia. I think that's the dream is for a hospital system to have a dedicated hernia group and just send it all so that yeah. if you do, let's say cancer surgery and your patient gets a hernia, don't try and feel like you need to be the same surgeon to fix the hernia, send it to the hernia group. You have a trauma surgeon that saves lives. Now they have a patient with a hernia, send it to the hernia group. Don't try and kind of keep that patient and you and really focus on that um, specialty focused repair. Because as we know, specialists always have better outcomes than non-specialists in every field. 100, 100%. I mean, if you're lucky, if you're a private practice surgeon out there and you don't, you're not next to some hernia center, go for it. You know what I mean? Do the best job that you can, et cetera. Yeah. 
But if you're lucky enough to work at a place with a dedicated hernia center and specialists, I mean, why not use it? You know? Totally agree. Totally agree. So um, when I, you know, advertise that you're coming, um, I actually asked you what topic you'd like to kind of focus on. And you said, oh, let's talk about hernia surgery in females. And I was like, that's a great idea. I always talk about it, but I feel like I've never really devoted it um, with uh, another surgeon. So I'm really excited. We have tons of questions that have been already um, submitted. So we're going to go through that. You may get some questions that come through our audience um, live, but we had like 15 questions submitted. So I'm really excited to, Let's to do it. That. So we're just going to go through them. Is that good? I love it. Let's go. All right. Question number one. Um, why are inguinal hernias more prevalent in males, but other kinds of hernias like femoral, umbilical, or hiatal occur more frequently in females? I don't know the patho, I don't know the reason behind the yeah. pathophysiology of ephemeral being more common um, than uh, an inguinal, I mean, uh, in a female than a male. Yeah. I don't know why a defect like that would form more commonly in the woman, but what I do know is that one, because women are more likely to have femoral hernias, you're more likely to have an incarceration in a female yes. with a femoral hernia. Very important. Is, Exactly. And incarceration is when something gets stuck in that hernia. And sometimes that could lead to an emergency surgery, right. which is why the recommendation is, and I strongly support that if a female comes into you with a groin hernia, probably the best approach is laparoscopic. I mean, I do, my first approach for inguinal hernias is laparoscopic anyways. Mm -hmm. um, but you have to rule out a femoral hernia in a female that comes in with a groin hernia. And unless you're prepared to do that via an open approach, um, which I don't know if a lot of young surgeons of my generation feel comfortable doing that, uh, I do think that women should be offered a laparoscopic or a robotic uh, a minimally invasive approach for groin hernias for exactly that reason. Yeah, so the European Hernia Society agrees with you. They say so many women undergo an ingual hernia pair, not laparoscopic, and this femoral hernia is missed. And, yeah. and many of them need another surgery and some of them actually die. That's the yeah. issue is people can die from femoral hernias, whereas people don't tend to die from inguinals, umbilicals, et cetera, hiatals, et cetera. But the one most dangerous hernia because it has the highest mortality rate is the little piece of small intestine stuck in a tight little femoral hernia. 100%. So I, yeah, I read it a long time ago, and I don't even remember where I read it, is that um, the, the force vectors are different for female versus male pelvis. So male pelvis is, tends to be narrow, and so the force is kind of, the vectors of force all focus towards the internal ring, whereas the female pelvis tends to be wider and flatter and broader, and therefore there's less forces directed specifically at the internal ring and their femoral sp space is broader because of that wider space. So there's more pressure uh, transmitted to the femoral space than the average kind of male um, pelvis. But I don't know that everyone, anyone's ever actually studied it, but that was like a theory. Yeah, the I mean, I, is, yeah. I would assume because the one big difference is the shape of the pelvis between a man or a woman yeah. that has to play a role. You know, I'm sure the to. spaces are are wider in a woman just yeah. because men's uh, pelvis are so narrow. Yeah. And then belly buttons, I just assume it's related to mostly pregnancy and. That brings like a, a good, lot more. Yeah. yeah. I mean, but that. If that's going to be related to pregnancy, I mean, that's a, a great segue <laughs> to talk about that. You know, the forces of the abdominal wall. Uh, that occur during pregnancy are really significant and they're well documented, right? Mm -hmm. They're kind of two main things that happen. Erectus diastasis, which is when yeah. uh, the middle of your belly, the connective tissue, which is usually one to two centimeters widen, yeah. and it's going to be most pronounced around the belly button area. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the natural accommodation of the abdominal wall for to fit a uterus and actually also elongation of the recti. Mm. So, um, if we're talking 
you know, if we're comparing populations between all folks, including women who have been pregnant, that's absolutely a leading factor. Yeah, because a lot of these belly button hernias are within a diastasis and they actually probably look even bigger. I watch, I don't know if you you do this, but I go on Instagram and look for belly button hernias. <laughs> <laughs> Just, I see uh, these, these like models and movie stars or whatever, they're constantly burying their abdominal wall. Um, and I'm like, that's a little belly button hernia. And then they get pregnant and then I follow that. And then now post-pregnancy, it's bigger. I kind of want to fix them. <laughs> I know. I, I do. My eyes are drawn. Even when I'm, you know, hanging out with friends poolside, I spot an umbilical yeah. hernia and I have to tell myself, don't say anything about that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just I know. let it ride. True story. I was, uh, I was at, at dinner and um, David Beckham was, was uh, at the salad bar right next to me. And okay. I had humble and brag. Had, I know, but check this out. He was with his family and I'm like, do I tell him he's got a little belly button hernia? Because he was, had some milk commercial, I think, with a shirt off. And I'm like, that's a belly button hernia. I'm like, oh, I'll just leave him alone. He's with family. It's not cool. But yeah, yeah. Almost, I'm I almost um, told him. <laughs> I just can't imagine David Beckham at a salad bar. Just yeah, it was a all, cheesy but... restaurant. It wasn't, a, it wasn't like a very nice restaurant you know, they don't okay. always dine, wine and dine, I guess. Um, okay. Right, uh, the the other, uh, hiatal hernia, I don't know about. That's not my thing. And I don't know that women have more hiatal hernias, but if they do, I assume that's from the increased abdominal pressure from pregnancy too, maybe. Yeah. yeah. I can't explain anything else about that. All right, cool. Um, next question is why do ingle hernias tend to manifest in males? Oh, sorry, this should be in females without obvious bulging. So men tend to have a bulge, women tend to have pain and less likely to have a bulge than like an obvious bulge than, than men. Any ideas about like presentation of her, like groin hernias and male versus female? I feel like it's just smaller, smaller space. <laughs> I mean, think about it. In a man, you have the spermatic cord, which yeah. contains the entire blood supply to the testicle and the vas deferens running through your internal ring and through your inguinal canal. In a Tons female, you're, you're just going to have a round ligament. Just like so, pasta size. Yeah. Teeny tiny. Um, so I think that that probably contributes to the size of the canal and the... Right. And remember, the late the round ligament goes to labia majora, whereas the testicular bundle and the vas deferens go all the way into your scrotum. Okay. So I think you just have much more opportunity for travel in a male than you do in a female. Good point. And that big ass, not big ass, the <laughs> testicle, you know, went down that pathway at some point yeah. when you were a kid. Absolutely. I mean, that's model. why you can do an entire physical exam on a man through a scrotum and feel the entire inguinal canal. You cannot do that in a female. That's you can't correct. access that space. That's really correct. Um, okay, here's a question live. When do you do surgery? Uh, when you do surgery on primary ingle hernias, do you use robotic or laparoscopic sticks approach and what guides your decision? So both are perfectly valid options. They're quite similar in terms of outcomes. I use the laparoscopic approach um, for no reason other than systemic issues. It's difficult to get robotic time in my hospital mm. and my ambulatory surgery center doesn't have a robot. So I keep my robotic time for my complex abdominal wall surgery and I yeah. do all my inguinal hernias laparoscopically. I don't believe that there is a difference for the patient, both robotic and laparoscopic inguinal hernia repairs. As a patient, you wake up with three little cuts on your belly, the same kind of uh, post-operative pain, quicker post-operative recovery, lower rates of infection, lower rates of chronic pain, all the benefits of an MIS repair. What about yeah. you, Shun? So I'll give you my take on it. Uh, like you, we currently do not have a robot in the surgery center, but there is a surgery center nearby that has one. So I'm getting privileges there because every so often I just, I just need more operating time and the hospital is, is not able to give it to me. Um, 
I like laparoscopic surgery. I think it's clean and beautiful. And I personally don't like the eight millimeter scars from the robot. I like the five millimeter scars from the laparoscopy. I mean, we even have a three millimeter pediatric tray we sometimes use for the thin patients that are maybe, uh, I don't know, models or actresses that need to have their belly exposed. So I like the daintiness of a laparoscopic surgery. So I use that for all the primary hernias. With the only exception is that for the comp, like you said, the complex ones, the ones where you do a lot of sewing, um, maybe a really, really big scrotal hernia, I would do those robotically because I do feel it's superior um, in certain aspects for these complex situations. But I kind of like being able to hide scars with the laparoscopic approach. And you can't hide scars with the robot. You have, there's very specific areas you have to put them. And I agree. Uh, yeah, that's my uh, stick. But yeah. I tell you, you know, people are like doing everything robotic now. It's almost like they forgot laparoscopy. Yeah, I mean, a, robotic surgery is fine. It's lovely. Yeah. It's really useful, it's especially for complex stuff, especially for ventral hernia stuff. It's nice yeah. to be able to sew on the ceiling. But um, yeah. first of all, it's nice to maintain your laparoscopic skills as a surgeon, yes, I you know? Yeah. And the only thing I will say is for an uncomplicated inguinal hernia, I don't know how you do yours, but mm -hmm. I use two Marilyn's to dissect the whole area, you mm -hmm. know? And with robotic surgery, you're frequently using a scissor and a Maryland. I don't know if that, mm -hmm. those are your arms. Yeah. I just think it's a little bit almost easier laparoscopically for the really straightforward ones. So I agree yeah. with you. Um, unless yeah. there's a reason, I think laparoscopy is good as gold for yeah. straightforward inguinal hernias. Yeah, but we've, I know a lot of surgeons that um, even were trained at MIS, but they were just never comfortable doing a laparoscopic inguinal hernia repair. It just wasn't. Yeah, there's a, there's a learning curve to it, and the robot it's hard. is here, and and with the robot, boom, they're doing it. Like that's it, so much easier. Well, I think part of the reason is at least when I was in training, everybody was very focused on doing a TEP for all the patients out there. There are two ways to do laparoscopic inguinal hernia repairs: TEP or TAP. And the main difference is: do you go into the belly and take down one layer of the abdominal wall to get to where you're going, or do you just kind of wiggle your way through the abdominal wall? And everyone was obsessed with the TEP, which you wiggle your way through the abdominal wall and you never have to enter the belly and all that stuff. Yeah. But it is a technically difficult operation and it's unnecessarily hard. And the cases needed to get good at that are somewhere about 150 to 200. And the cases needed to get good at the other way is about 50. So mm. we kept trying to teach ourselves how to do the harder operation. I think a tap is much easier. And I think folks like robotic surgery because it's always a tap. Nobody does robo taps. So uh, yeah. I think we made it unnecessarily difficult. True, yeah, I agree with that. Although I really like the tap. <laughs> yeah, it's lovely, um, but it's also, it's, it's not hard. a, I don't it's consider hard. it a failure to do a, to do a tap. Agreed, yeah, totally agree. All right, here's a complicated question. Um, okay. I got incisional and ventral and bilateral indirect hernias after a deep flap for breast cancer reconstruction surgery. So deep flap, for those mm -hmm. who don't know, it's the plastic reconstructive surgery where they take the skin and fat from your lower abdomen and they make a breast. Um, it's kind of like a reconstructive operation. It has some abdominal wall implications if there's injury to the abdominal wall in doing that. Um, the hernia repair surgery is via an a low incision across my abdomen and goes to the right and left groin area. Question number one, could the bilateral indirect angle hernias have been caused from the incision from my deep flap? No. No, agree. Yeah. Um, now, if you had a tram flap, you get kind of like a tummy tuck as part of that and the increased abdominal pressure or like tension by pulling like a really tight reconstruction from a tram flap potentially can open up the hole of the groin a little bit bigger and give you hernias. I've seen that, but not from a deep flap. Um, I've had all of these hernias repaired with sutures and mesh. I'm now suffering from 
chronic autoimmune inflammatory syndrome from the polypropylene mesh, and I have a recurrent right inguinal hernia and a hiatal hernia due to private prior abdominal surgery. What are my options to get the mesh removed and have these recurrent hernias repaired without any mesh since my immune system cannot tolerate any foreign body implants? This is a growing problem, I feel, that we're dealing um, with, that we're seeing. It's, that's a tough situation. You can't yeah. fix any of those hernias without synthetic mesh. Agreed. So if you have true autoimmune disorders, you don't have many options. Because if you were to take out all that mesh, which would be an extremely destructive process, because when you take mesh out, you take the tissue that has integrated into it, which is part of your abdominal wall, you have to fix it then. And if you try to fix it with a non-synthetic mesh, uh, either a biologic mesh or a bioabsorbable mesh, when that mesh goes away, you're gonna be in trouble. So if you are trying to seek a non-synthetic option here, there are no good ones. And that's just the reality. Because the problem with the flaps is that they have taken a part of your body and put it someplace else to reconstruct, which is completely valid. But that part of your, part of your abdominal wall now is, is missing. And you, um, ca you can't bring it back. So it's a really yeah. tough problem. So really every so problem. often, yeah, every so often I have to remove mesh and do a tissue repair. Um, it's doable, but it's not ideal because you're mm -hmm. going backwards, right? You're like, take instead of taking like fresh tissue and doing tissue repair, you now have like destroyed tissue doing tissue repair. So it's a much worse situation than yeah. you know, reading a book about how great the shoulder ice is. Um, but here's the thing. What if I told you she has a plug and patch and that's why she has pain? Oh, wow. Well, that's actually that's... A plug patch. different story. <laughs> I love taking out plug and patches. <laughs> if, yeah. um, if you have a plug and patch and you have pain because of that, that's a fixable issue. That's yeah. a fixable issue. So I take those out not infrequently. Folks really feel that plug. It's almost like they describe it like a rock in their groin. Yeah. Um, and for people that present with pain after that surgery, I offer them to take that mesh out and then either do a primary repair if the tissue is adequate, or I do a posterior repair at that same time. Okay. What if she's 80 years old? Then I ask how, what is your quality of life? You yeah. know what I mean? If you can live your life and you have some pain that's treated with some Tylenol or ibuprofen and otherwise you're okay then I would say, just leave it. If you mm -hmm. can't live your life, if you're not happy, if it's stopping you from doing the things that you love to do, that's when I offer yeah. folks surgery. Um, the last comment she makes is, my doctor wants me to try a nerve injection for my pain from the left angle hernia surgery. I would like to say, I am so tired of everyone treating all of the groin pain as a nerve injection. A plug pain, will not get better from nerve injection or hernia recurrence will not get better from a hernia re uh, nerve injection. A laparoscopic repair will, doesn't indicate like a nerve injection usually. So I feel like so many doctors that don't understand what we do or what's been done to the patient see hernia pain equals nerve injection. Do you see that too? It just really bugs me. I'm sorry. No, it's true. It just requires to not do that requires a real level of understanding about groin pain and inguinodynia oh. that I'd say, if you're not a hernia specialist, you probably don't have. So yeah. I understand why it happens, but I agree with you, it's unnecessary. You know, you need to have signs and symptoms of neuropathic pain, of nerve pain for nerve injections to help. Yeah. Um, if it's no susceptible, if it's, from, if it's from the actual mesh, you know, the nerve injections are probably not gonna do much. Yeah. Okay, here's another question. Does Columbia have expertise in managing sports hernias or athletic pubalgia and other non-hernia related groin disruptions? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I take care of those all the time. Um, with sports hernias, we actually have a team. Uh, Dr. Christian is our hip specialist because, um, I mean, sports hernias, first of all, is not, is not the correct term, but it's the right. term that's been used. Athletic pubalgia, um, groin pain. The groin is multifactorial. You've got to rule out any kind of hip issues, core issues. I take care of um, 
you know, if folks need adductor tenotomies, if there's something wrong with their adductors or rectus abdominis complexes, if there's inflammation around their pubic synthesis, um, getting mini repairs in the groin, these are all things I do. But mm -hmm. we also have a Dr. Christian who's our hip specialist to make sure that the hip isn't contribu contributing. We have Dr. Desai who does a lot of ultrasound guided interventions, will do PRP injections into the adductors and things like that. So the short answer to the question is absolutely. I love our team. I think we kind of attack uh, athletic pubalgia from all fronts. That's great. Um, yeah, it's great. It's a growing business. Yeah, and it's it's. I had a patient today who had who thought he had a hernia. It's clearly her uh, hip. In other words, my nurse came and said, "Oh, this is a hip, but go ahead and see him anyway." <laughs> um, <laughs> But Good yeah, nerve. it's there's a lot of overlap with orthopedics, pain management, uh, sports medicine, and so on. Um, yeah. uh, as a follow up, they're asking what operations do you do for athletic pubalgia. So That's if I think that question. there's, if I think there's a slam dunk adductor pathology, let's say you love to play tennis. You're playing tennis, you go for a lateral move, you feel a sharp pain in your groin, you get an MRI, I see a big tear in your adductor, mm. we try physical therapy, that doesn't help, we try rest, that doesn't help, and you can't get back on the court, I would offer you an adductor um, tenotomy where we actually just shave that adductor off the, the pubic symphysis. I like to pair that with a little mini groin repair where I would mm -hmm. actually go into your inguinal canal and tighten up the floor as well. Um, no mesh, nothing like that. Uh, sometimes if I see obvious rectus abdominis pathology, I could also look at the RA tendon assertion into your pubic symphysis. Yeah. That's what I can offer you, um, for sports hernias. Right. Uh, here's a question about patients with chronic pain after surgery. How do you know if it's nerve related or adhesions? Well, it's probably not adhesions. No. Um, if you have an open inguinal hernia repair, we're not even in the belly. So it's probably not adhesions. If you have a laparoscopic inguinal hernia repair, maybe, but it, it's probably not going to be adhesions. For folks that have inguinal hernia repair and then have pain after, as a hernia surgeon, you got to map them to figure out what's going on. So basically I look at somebody's groin, I take a little Q-tip and I poke around and I say, does it hurt here? Does it hurt here? Does it hurt here? And then you tell me where it hurts. And if the distribution of your pain seems like it might even vaguely follow a nerve and you tell me it burns and tell me I woke up like this, then I say, okay, maybe there's a nerve involved. And the surgery has to make sense. If you get a laparoscopic inguinal hernia repair, you're not really interacting with the nerves, which is why the rates of right. chronic pain are yeah. lower for a laparoscopic inguinal hernia yeah. repair. Very uncommon. Something has had to, you know, folks still get into the wrong planes, it could happen. But <sighs> if you have an open inguinal hernia repair, that makes more sense. Right. Um, if I ask you where the pain is and all you're showing me is where the scar is, or you take one finger and you're saying right there, and then you've had like an open plug, that's when we start thinking, okay, this is probably from either inflammation from the surgery or the actual mesh itself. Now you do a lot of abdominal wall as opposed to groin. What percentage of your practice do you think is, is a, like ventral abdominal wall flank compared to groin pelvis? Um, you know, it's like 50, 50, like this week, okay. for instance, I had four, yeah. four inguinals and four eyeballs. Yeah. So yeah, well, you know, inguinal hernias are just so common. Um, but in terms of complex stuff, you know, probably more, ab more complex eyeball than complex groin. So do you see much nerve injury with abdominal wall? There's, it's one of the questions about um, I think the nerve versus adhesions is a chronic abdominal wall pain after abdominal wall surgery. Oh, um, I see neurologists, like uh, folks that have had a lot of abdominal surgery will come in with either numbness in their abdominal wall, even after I, sometimes before I fix their hernia, sometimes yeah. after my complex abdominal, yeah. or hypersensitivity too. Um, those yeah. are kind of the main things I see. And um, this other question has to do with denervation of the abdominal wall after abdominal wall surgery. Um, how do you pre prepare, how do you repair a denervated abdominal wall that was caused after mesh implantation surgery and was noted 
once the mesh was removed. This is very complicated. Uh, this patient has been on this form before. Um, sounds like she had some type of abdominal wall, hernia repair, or maybe even tummy tuck. Anyway, the mesh was removed and now she has a denervation injury. Uh, how mm -hmm. do you treat denervation injuries of the abdominal wall or do you? Well, you can't ever um, regenerate the nerve. What's yeah. been denervated has been denervated. So I always can't counsel folks that it'll never be back to the way it was, but right. I can help folks with obvious bulging or laxity. And I would do a complex abdominal wall reconstruction on them and reinforce the repair with a heavyweight mesh to give them a bit more support and contour. Yeah. And that's, I think, the best that we can offer for denervation injuries. And if this patient had the mesh removed specifically because she was reacting abnormally to the mesh? Tough situation. situation, you know, yeah. not many options, maybe some plications if it's kind of like a semi-lunar line issue. Um, but, you know, eventually uh, once enough damage has been done, there's only so much we can do. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Um, question, what do you as surgeons think will be different and better five to 10 years from now for inguinal hernia surgery? That's a good question. Ooh, that's a good question. Well, the first yeah. thing you got to always consider is, is a uh, mesh technology. Um, Yes. Mesh technology is always changing. For patients like these couple that are already on this forum, yeah. you know, they need to Absolutely. be helped. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I think uh, robotics will open the way for a lot more minimally invasive options for folks that even have, you know, complex hernia, hernia options. Yeah. I think that tissue repairs are going to be, are going to make join the back. armamentarium. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think for a long time, especially after, you know, Lichtenstein described his mesh repair in the 90s, yeah. the odds. Of At my hospital, mesh... by the way. But yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. West Coast. Uh, <laughs> but I think now we're, we're going back to understanding that a mesh repair, I mean, a tissue repair is suitable for certain patients um, and we should get good at that. So I yeah. think that's also going to get back, back into vogue. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Um, going back to the whole male-female thing, are there any differences in difficulty between male and female hernia surgery anywhere in the body? Yeah, I mean, in the groin, men are more difficult because we have to protect the, the spermatic cord and the vas deferens, whereas yeah. uh, in a female, we can just take the round ligament. So I would mm -hmm. say for a pelvic surgery, um, men are more complicated than women. Yeah. Uh, for ventral hernia surgery, women become more complicated because of the prevalence of diastasis. Mm -hmm. And also because you have to consider uh, if they're going to have children or not. Good um, Most people don't just talk to their patients about the effect of pregnancy. Yeah. So there are two, there are two things that we know can happen if a woman gets uh, pregnant after having a ventral hernia repair with mesh. She can experience pain and discomfort when she's pregnant because mm -hmm. as the abdominal wall stretches, the mesh doesn't, mm -hmm. and that can cause discomfort. And it increases the risk of the hernia coming back. So if you have a 30 something year old who wants to get pregnant, has an incisional hernia, you have to think about it a little bit harder than you do with a man. You have right. to consider whether you want to burn bridges in terms of offering hernia repairs, and you want to consider maybe using bioabsorbable mesh like Phasix that gives folks a better repair than a biologic mesh, a little bit of a worse repair than the synthetic mesh, yeah. but can do the trick for people in that age group. And I don't know if a lot of folks out there know that, so that's conversations they should be having. And then for belly button hernias, if you have a diastasis, you usually have to address that. So, yeah, which is what we're I, learning more and more. It used to be that a lot of this stuff was not addressed. It's, and I feel like, I, mean, I don't know, maybe I'm biased, but it's more of a female thing. And so it's kind of like, okay, whatever, we're just going to fix your belly button hernia. Uh, whereas in men, it's usually a, like a simple operation. Women, you need a little bit more thought into it. You know, are they potentially going to get pregnant? And is there a diastasis involved as part of this very simple, otherwise, belly button hernia repair? Absolutely. Yeah. There are differences in, in gendered care. We know that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm happy. I'd we're love talking to learn more. Now. There's some questions here about um, 
gender differences. Uh, okay, here's another one. Regarding recurrence and complications after hernia treatment, are there any differences between males and females? Um, interestingly enough, uh, the, the female gender has been associated with worse pain following hernia repair. Yes. And that's, yeah, that's been in Why a do couple you think of that studies. Is for inguinal hernias, I have my own theory. What, what's your theory? I don't know. I don't think I have a good one. What's your theory? <laughs> <laughs> my theory is, correct me if I'm wrong, male and female pelvis are very different. The size Correct. is different. The shape is different. The apparently the, the the concentration of nerves is also different, much higher in women. So partially, I think it's because we do the same exact operation for men and women for angle hernias, same size mesh, same techniques, same, everything's the same. But we know that the incidence of hernias is different, angle, direct, indirect, and the anatomy is different. So I think part of it is that. And the other part I think is these women don't necessarily have hernias. They have endometriosis or ovarian cyst or hip disorder or something else that is a bit more complicated. Pelvic pain in women is a little bit more complicated than in men. And just because they have a hernia doesn't mean that's the cause of their pain. Because I see the men too, they have, let's say a hernia, they go to their doctor, and they complain of some type of pelvic pain that's not due to the hernia. But the hernia is the obvious thing. They're like, okay, we'll fix your hernia. So now they have the same preoperative pain, plus they have possibly a complication from the hernia repair. So I feel that's just more common in women. I don't know. I think that's a great idea. Brings up the question of, you know, should there be gendered mesh, mm -hmm. right? Like if the, if the form of the pelvis is, is different, should we be using the same type of mesh in men or women? What do you think about that? Who knows? <laughs> um, I can see it being different in the future, which is great. You know, if it works better, mazel. But I agree with everything that you said. Um, groin pain is complicated. Yeah. The reality is that groin pain is complicated in men or women because it could be multifactorial. Yeah. And sometimes the hernia, even when it's there, is not the reason for the groin pain. So yeah. it just takes take some work yeah like the guy that came today it was completely a hip issue he was limping he had difficulty sleeping he had to go frog legged he couldn't cross his legs he had a hernia but that was the yeah thing. yeah I agree. Um, yeah do the factors that affect the decision to use mesh and the kind of mesh used differ between males and females uh do the factors to use mesh um another good question i would that is a good question um yeah. i don't when there's a if a male or a female presents with a significant direct hernia which is the type of inguinal hernia i'm using a regular weight mesh the yeah. only difference that i would do is i i find myself using um a large sized mesh in women and an extra large in men mm -hmm. uh, and i think that's just the space that's down there yeah. 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 I mean, women tend to be thinner. They tend to be more like, a, like I had a ballerina last uh, two weeks, three weeks ago. You know, I treat ballerinas differently than football players. You know what I mean? So yeah. there, there's a little bit of difference um, in that. Here's another question. Does Dr. Podolsky perform tissue repairs? And if so, which one does she prefer? Yeah, I like a tissue repair. Um, because oh, I think where it did actually you learn tissue repair? Um, well, I did my fellowship in hernia surgery. So Yuri yes, and I did. did some tissue repairs, but then um, I've been able to do a lot of courses through Yuri over the years, through right. AHS, um, his hernia summit. And uh, I learned through some folks that I got to do real life tissue repairs with like David Chen and those pe those people. Um, I love a tissue repair because I think it actually requires technical expertise yes, above a, a laparoscopic. Yeah. yeah, it really. You really got to know your anatomy to do a tissue repair, um, yeah. and I don't think a lot of people know how to do it. So it makes me feel like I really have something to offer people. Yeah, uh, yeah. I like a tissue repair for thin people who are younger, 
uh, with good, good, good fashion. Yeah. I have no problem offering it to them. The, if you do a good tissue repair, you got good results. Interestingly enough, rates of pain are the same with or without mesh, which is really fascinating. Uh, mm -hmm. I had a patient the other day ask me if I use steel sutures like they do at the Shoulders Clinic in mm -hmm. Canada. I do not. I use proline sutures. Do you know why they but use steel like sutures? No, tell me. It's expensive to have the pre-made non-steel. That's the only reason why. So they actually, if you go to the Shoulders Clinic in the back, there's like a sterile room and there are some women that are putting steel rods into the into the uh swedged on uh, needles and making they make their own sutures they don't wow. pay like brand name sutures because it's a government sponsored clinic and they get paid a certain amount per resident canadian resident i mean this was back in the day they're doing much better now financially because there's so much hype about the clinic that like americans and non-canadians go there but so they, they get they pay premium for that but um, yeah, you know, it's a financial, it was completely a financial decision. At least that's what they told me. I'm, have you, did you go up there? Have you spent time there? Yeah, yeah. Wow. Long time ago. That's I'm going to awesome. say uh, 2005, maybe. Yeah. And that, you just went to learn? You know, I think I saw their head I think I saw him at like a meeting. He's like, oh, you should come by. I'm like, I will. And I was in Toronto yeah. for something. I don't remember what. And I call him up. I'm like, they're like, yeah, come on over. So I just went over and they gave me a tour. I got to watch a bunch of operations and check out their whole process. It's a very fascinating process. You know, they don't have anesthesiologists. I didn't so know that. The oh, nurse, what? the patient sits in the pre-op area. The nurse gives the patient some pills. Um, I think it's like, don't quote me on this, but it's like, let's say Vicodin and maybe a Xanax or something, Ativan, something like that. And the patient walks into the operating room, puts himself on the operating room table. I was standing where the anesthesiologist would have been. There's no anesthesiologist. They just are kind of like in this daze from the pill that they took. And okay. then there's two surgeons, two, two uh, qualified surgeons. There's no like PA or assistant. Um, so two surgeons operate together and they use tons of local. So they have a bucket of local that's very diluted and they have this syringe system. And, you know, usually you get the syringe, the nurse, they, but, yeah. you know, they have this like two-way valve. There's like a, there's like a uh, tube in this bucket that drains onto the syringe. Every time you go like this, it fills a syringe and then you eject and you go, you open it fills a syringe. It's the, I love it. They don't use a cautery pen. There's no bovi. That's expensive. Um, wow. Yeah. And so everything is a knife and, and ties? Huh? Knife and ties. Every that's it. Knife and ties. I love it. Yeah. They don't, they don't close the skin. They have these little metal um, disposal, not disposal, reusable little metal clips. The patient stays mm -hmm. there for day, three days. Day two, they take off half the clips, and day three, they take off the other half, and then they go home. But think about that. Patients fascinating. I know. I mean, look, obviously, what they're doing is working. Yeah. I think it's great. Yeah, uh, it three days in the hospital after an open inguinal hernia repair. I don't think you can get that in this country anymore. No. Um, <laughs> but they did popularize and, you know, legitimize a nice tissue based repair. Yes. And yes. that's important too. Very good. Uh, regarding angle hernias in women, do you routinely sacrifice the round ligament? I do. Not 100% of the time. Sometimes you'll find a rare um, case where you can really peritonealize it off the round ligament. Yeah. Um, but almost always the peritoneum and the round ligament are so adhered that you can't pull that exactly. peritoneum back back enough. Yeah. So. And by the way, yes. I, I have at, talked to a gynecologist. You know, I asked, do we sacrifice the round ligament because surgery was, you know, invented by men or yes. is it actually okay? And I, they gave me confirmation that you can sacrifice the round ligament and it's fine. Okay. I'm going to add to that. I need to publish this data because I've talked to every single urogynecologist and gynecologist I could find and have asked them the same question. They're like, cut it. 
Then you talk to Take a it. general surgeon and they're like sweating, like, oh no, don't cut the round ligament. What if the uterine prolapses or or retroverts? And all the gynecologists like, who cares? <laughs> yeah, the gynecologists are not happen. worried about it. If so they're, they're not worried about it, I'm not worried about it. Yeah, so uh, please spread the word. I have a very quick survey asking surgeons what they do about it, how do they handle the round ligament. It's pinned on my tw on my Twitter page. Um, mm -hmm. So if you haven't filled it out, please fill it out for me. I would like to know uh, your answer. And it's been sent to all the different GYN and urology, um, your, your gyn societies to get their input too, because uh, we need to like put an end to this round ligament controversy. Absolutely. I love um, it. Right? Also, a recent study showed people who routinely um, sacrifice a round ligament, those patients had less chronic pain than when the round ligament was uh, kept. I'm not surprised. Right? Because I'm, I'm worried about that inferior border of your mesh if you don't sacrifice yes. round ligament. Agreed. Agreed. How do you identify a spigalian hernia and can it be repaired during a tummy tuck? A uh, physical exam. If I can't do a physical exam and I have an ultrasound handy, I'll pop an yeah. ultrasound in the belly. And if I don't have that and I can't feel anything, I'll get a CAT scan. Those are the three easy ways to identify a uh, spigalian hernia. It can be repaired during a tummy tuck um, if it goes through all three layers of the abdominal wall. Yeah. Uh, sometimes it's... Um, only through the transversalis and the internal. Yeah. Um, but if it goes through all three layers of the abdominal wall and you can see it externally during a tummy tuck, a surgeon could just use a simple suture to close it primarily. Probably wouldn't be a mesh-based repair or anything like that. Agreed. Uh, you've given several talks about in-office ultrasound use. See, people are watching you, Dina. Can you believe this? How do you use ultrasound in your practice? So you just mentioned that you would have ultrasound like a like for a spigalian. Yeah. So you just have one in the office. Yeah. So unfortunately, we have two offices. One has an ultrasound, one doesn't. Okay. So I only have access to it uh, fifty percent of the time. Um, but I love it for a couple of things. Uh, yeah. Somebody comes in with an umbilical hernia. I'll just look at their abdominal wall to see if they have a diastasis. Mm. Um, that's a super simple thing for things like spigalian hernias and little incisional hernias. I just pop it on the abdominal wall. Um, I do like a physical exam for inguinal hernias. I try to use it for ones that are equivocal. Uh, but if I really can't feel it, I'll send it out to the radiologist because doing mm. an, uh, ultrasound in the groin can get a little difficult. Um, and then in terms of injections, I do do my own nerve injections, iliogastric, iliohypogastric, right. uh, ilioinguinal, iliohypogastric. And I've started to do some adductor injections. Like I have one coming up for folks that have adductor pathology, but the picture is not clear. Then they don't really qualify to undergo a tenotomy, but I mm -hmm. want to rule out adductor related pain. I will inject right where the adductor lands in the pubic symphysis with some arcane to see if they get relief. So those are a couple of quick and easy things I do. Yeah, I think the local is a great one because they're in your office instead of setting the page to pain management, then it's like uh, several weeks and it just delays their care. The other thing I don't understand about pain management is they put the patients under often for these local, I just do in the office. Do you, you're okay like no, doing just, it awake, right? I'm not weird. <laughs> no, no. Yeah, I mean, the, once you get, once you get good at it, you know, a nerve injection takes five minutes. Yeah. Um, and you're there. So the patient, you can get good feedback from the patient when they say, oh yeah, my pain's like hundred percent gone or 20% gone or something like that. Right. Yeah. A hundred percent. Besides, I just feel like as a hernia surgeon, if I weren't able to do my own injections, yeah, I don't know. I'm trying to get that street cred out there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you do have street cred, for sure. Thank you. Um, at Columbia, do they ever recommend single or triple neurectomy? Okay, so what they mean is, uh, do you do selective or triple neurectomy for chronic post ingual hernia pain? And the second part of the question is, uh, do, you, do you prefer instead to send them for uh, either spinal cord or dorsal ganglion stimulation? 
Um, I've only had one patient that I was trying to treat for chronic pain. I wasn't able to help and they eventually went to pain management and got yeah. the dorsal stimulation. I'm not sure that helped either. Um, I would, I send, you know, if, if I've done everything I can for somebody and patients love horrible pain, that's when I would refer out to pain management. I believe everybody in our practice does triple nerectomies. Um, kind of leave no nerve behind philosophy on that. Um, yeah. The only time we would do a selective nerectomy is if we do a posterior mesh removal. Like if somebody's had a lap or a robo mesh mm -hmm. repair and has pain, when we take the mesh out, we do usually pair it with a GFN nerectomy. The general mm -hmm. femoral nerve will be right there. That's the only time we do a selective nerectomy. Do you always do that with mesh removal laparoscopically? Or robotically? Not a hundred, usually, but not a hundred percent. I had a patient who had fibromyalgia that I didn't do it on because there's some consideration that those folks do worse uh, when you mm -hmm. cut their nerves. Yeah. Um, if there's an obvious interaction between the mesh and the nerve, I would definitely take it. So we interestingly looked at all of the neurectomies I've ever done, and we stratified it based on um, elective or well, therapeutic and kind of like incidental. So therapeutic was we knew before surgery, we had to go in there to address a nerve related problem, neuralgia, neuroma, whatever. Um, and incidental was we were in there, let's say removing mesh. And we saw that the process of removing mesh, for example, would injure a nurse when we cut that nerve. Or we're in mm -hmm. there doing an elective hernia repair. And for whatever reason, the nerve is either Damage looks horrible, uh, it's in the way, may get injured, so we cut it. And what we noticed, which I did not expect is, first of all, our, our neuroma rate was 4%, which is about the same, I think the literature says 5%, so it's about the same as expected. But those who had the incidental neuroma, all did fine. No neuromas, no chronic pain, really no issues, which is interesting to me. Um, I thought for sure it would be like a risky operation at least, but so far, not that we could show it in our data. The people who had the therapeutic neuromas, um, a good percentage of them after surgery, I think it was like 17% in that range, like one out of five, needed subsequent therapy. So another nerve block to kind of medication to kind of calm down that nerve. And 3% um, of those ended up with even more complications, including complex regional pain syndrome, which as you know, is a very devastating complication of, of like basically the nerves in your whole body are like going haywire. It's very, very difficult to treat. So I think what you mean, like for example, with the fibromyalgia patient, maybe those that, that kind of patient is more prone to going down that difficult path of like, recurrent pain and nerve pain and then um, it overwhelming the the body and so on so but isn't that interesting the we found zero percent pain with the incidentals but a good amount of difficulty and needing more therapies for these more complicated patients that already have nerve pain to begin with um i'm not surprised you know the data yeah. confirms that higher rates of preoperative pain lead to higher rates of postoperative pain. So yeah. if you come in already in pain, it's hard to get you to 100% pain-free. And yeah. that has, because pain is so complex. Sometimes it's yeah. not a physical problem. The pain cycle, right? The nerves that are triggered might still be going on even after you cut a nerve, the regional inflammation, um, I mean, think about how interesting phantom limb syndrome is, right? Yeah. For the folks out there who lost a limb and were in horrible pain. And when you showed the body a mirror where the body saw the limb in place, the pain went away. Pain is cerebral, it's physical, it's complex. Yeah. I'm gonna give you one more question because that was submitted and I'd like to be able to help answer her question. And then sure. this will be the end. So I carry weight in my abdomen and my hernia is getting worse. Should I lose weight first? I'm age 59 and weigh 260 pounds. Yeah, absolutely. 
We know yeah. all complications following hernia surgery increase at a BMI of 35 and up. Um, mm -hmm. BMI is body mass index. It's how we figure out your weight compared to your height. Um, lower weight in hernia surgery leads to lower recurrences, better outcomes as it does in a lot of different surgery. So if there's an opportunity for weight loss before a hernia operation, absolutely go for it. So thank you. That was it. I'm so happy to have you as my guest. We went through tons of questions and you can't see, but we have about another 10 questions that have been submitted live. And I didn't go through about three or four of the questions that were submitted before. So obviously very important topic. Everyone wants to hear about you. So I do appreciate so much that you volunteered your time to help educate us and, you know, help advocate Thank you for so much. better sex-based, gender-based care. Absolutely. Thank you for inviting me. This was fantastic. Thanks for all the folks listening and the questions. Um, I love this platform. platform. You've done a great job. Thank you. And that ends us for Hardy Talk Live. Thanks everyone for joining me. I love that you join and ask so many questions. Please go to my YouTube channel and watch all the other episodes and share the one that we did today. And I will see you next week on Hernia Talk Tuesdays. Bye everyone. And thanks again, right. Dina. Really appreciate it. See Have you. a good night. Bye.